sounds like this is on, right? Um, we ought to get our session started, um, uh, in particular because one of our speakers has to be out of the room at 10 to 4. And so um, I suspect that some of you are going to have some questions for her. And uh, we just want to make sure that we don't, uh, we don't eat up too much into uh, question and answer and discussion time. I've encouraged the speakers to keep their remarks as non-technical as possible. Um, there's some very juicy human rights and civil liberties issues presented by this case and by this topic, and I imagine some of you will really want to get into that discussion. So, first of all, my name is Janet Keeping. Um, I'm president of an organization that's based in Calgary called the Sheldon Schumer Foundation for Ethics and Leadership. Um, I am a lawyer by training, and I'm called to the bar, but I never feel less like a lawyer than when I'm surrounded by law students who, um, even in your first couple of months, probably know tons more than I can remember. So it's, <laughs> in its own funny way, intimidating. Um, let me just say um, that I'm going to keep, uh, you've got information in your booklets um, on speakers. I'm not going to go through that. All I'm going to say, um, I'm going to sort of some housekeeping details and just mention their names and then we'll get started. The housekeeping details are that the speakers have agreed to keep their remarks to 10 minutes. I'll be giving them warnings at two when they've got two left and when time's finished. And we're doing that deliberately to try to leave time for for discussion and questions. They may get into it amongst themselves, um, but we will give you priority during question time before they start uh, interacting with, with each other. So our panelists today, and of course this is the session that is on the NS against um, uh, the Queen case. As you probably know, if you've read the Ontario Court of Appeal decision that was released this week, then you most assuredly do know, this is a procedural question that arose in the context of a criminal prosecution. The criminal prosecution alleges very ser serious um, sexual assaults. Uh, the complainant uh, uh, is actually the witness, if you know the case at all. She is the person who doesn't want to take off her kneecap in testifying at the preliminary inquiry. I hope we don't have to spend a lot of time on the difference between preliminary inquiry and trial. There is something to be said there, and, and there's no reason why you have to stay away completely from it. But all this procedural stuff arose out of a preliminary inquiry, which these folks will tell you is something like, is there enough evidence to go to trial, I suppose, is what it is. So um, we have, uh, it's the queen against, um, against this witness because the witness does not want to take off the kneecap to testify. Um, she was ordered by the judge of the preliminary inquiry to take it off, and this has been taken further. So you have the Ontario Court of Appeal decision this week um, saying the matter has to go back to the judge at the preliminary inquiry, but giving that judge guidance as to what sort of principles should be taken into account. So that's what we'll be talking about um, today. And we are uh, privileged to have four speakers. Um, one over will be your first speaker, Susan Chapman. Next, uh, and these are, they're going to speak in the order in which you have them in your program. Michael Deneen, Tyler Hodgson, and Zara Danani. So I'm just going to take it from there and uh, keep them in line with, uh, with timing. So please. Thank you. Good afternoon. So um, about eight months ago when I got a call from Joanna Bierenbaum, uh, the legal director of LEAF, uh, asking me whether I would intervene in a case in the Court of Appeal for LEAF, I thought, oh, right on, terrific. What's the issue? Um, a woman wants to wear her niqab and we want to support her. And at first blush I thought, wow, really? Okay. Um, that's interesting. So we're a feminist organization and we are going to be going into court to support the right of a woman to wear this uh, symbol, um, religious symbol, which I had been brought up to assume was one of religious or gender depression. And, uh, but very quickly I came to work through it and understand it in a very, very different way and as an access to justice issue. However you may feel about uh, religious uh, views, uh, about religious garb, about the niqab in particular, soon became very much beside the point. The case was a sexual assault case. The complainant came forward saying that her uncle and cousin had sexually abused her over the course of many years when she was a small child. 
When she arrived in court, she was asked to remove her veil as a precondition to testify. And very soon I arrived at the view that regardless of what you think of the niqab, to force a religious woman to, over her objection, remove an article of clothing as a precondition to testifying at a sexual assault trial is highly problematic. And it's problematic for, for numerous reasons. And the obvious ones relate to religious freedom and to multiculturalism and to a justice system that needs to evolve and keep up and not accommodate but include people from all sorts of communities, in particular minority communities, who have been reticent to come forward in the past and participate in the justice system through distrust, discrimination, um, and often well-founded. So in the end, I felt 100% sure that we were doing the right thing. I agreed to argue the case, and the decision was released on Thursday. And it's a very interesting, complicated decision because obviously – it involves a whole host of constitutionally protected rights, not the least of which is the accused right to make full answer and defense in a very serious charge. But I wanted to emphasize not just or even primarily the religious freedom issue engaged in the case, but the equality rights issue. In the current climate with Islamophobia, with uh, with a heightened nastiness towards certain minority communities, coupled with, because you can't decontextualize these things, you have to, people come to court as a package. They're a woman, they're from a minority community, they're a religious person. You can't decontextualize, you have to look at them as a whole. And for a woman in a sexual assault case, to be ordered to be stripped of a piece of clothing, which for some women is akin to my, for example, having to remove my top to testify. That it is a very profound deterrent to a group of already marginalized people to participate in the justice system and to avail themselves of their rights. And looked at in that way, uh, it became a very different case for me. And on Monday, it's October 18th, that is the 80th anniversary of the uh, person's case, which as you know, um, the House of Lords, all the boys in the House of Lords decided that person includes in the BNA Act um, a woman, no doubt much the shock and horror of people at the time, and wide criticism, but what that case is at bottom about is recognizing and including people in participating in democratic institutions and not creating artificial barriers to them doing so. And it causes us to reevaluate the assumptions that we make about those institutions. So, for example, when I was preparing my oral argument in the office about the NACAB case, I said, well, why? Why is, de you know, why is demeanor evidence so important? And, 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 and where is that? Where's, where is that written? And um, one of my colleagues pointed out, that would be 800 years of common law. And I thought, good point. Uh, but when you strip that away, the same thing could be said in the, in the person's case, right? And that was a very weighty, weighty argument in the person's case. No woman had ever been permitted to hold that type of office, to participate on that level. And it's interesting to go back and reread the case because they're really struggling to look for precedents. Well, women have been church wardens and sextons and not messed it up. So there is some precedent for it. Um, and so the gentleman decided that uh, there are some extraordinary, exceptional women out there that may be qualified to do this job, like you have to be exceptional to be qualified as a politician in this country. <laughs> and therefore... We are going to open it up to women. And as I say, no doubt it caused a serious loss of faith in the justice system. Um, a few years earlier, the House of Lords had decided for itself that women could not be members of the House of Lords. 
but for the colonies, um, it was all right to, to dilute in that way and, and let the riffraff in the door. So in many respects, um, and obviously that was hugely momentous and the numbers were great, whereas in this case, this is the only case I'm aware of where an issue's ever been taken with a woman wearing in a cab. And given how we uh, transcribe our, our trials, it's not clear to me. Is that because no women from that community have come forward and asked to be witnesses in these cases? And if that's what's really going on, then isn't that itself of grave concern? It's a huge member of our population, and none of them are participating. I did speak to my uh, colleague, Marla Sedworth, and I said to her, what about the Aurora? Surely somebody showed up in a, in a cab. They did without incident. They testified and without incident. And again, that fortified me in my view that it's about the sexual assault. It's about, uh, about a nakedness of women that needs to be revealed in a sexual assault trial, unlike in any other type of case. And so Leaf pitched this first and foremost as an equality case, racial equality, because after 9-11, Islam can be seen in racial terms. And so it's race, it's religion, it's gender, all inextricably linked. And our justice system needs to continue to evolve to evaluate its basic assumptions, like women can't be in Senate, or like demeanor evidence is so very important. We need to submit these assumptions to vigorous forensic analysis. Is that true? Is demeanor evidence important? Or is it often misused? Is it particularly misused, for example, in a cross-cultural context? Can the witness herself perform properly as a witness when she is stripped bare? Or will she, in fact, be acting with an awkwardness that as I say, I would be if I was made to testify without my top on. Would I, could I be myself, and could I provide a full and frank account of the events in that environment? Or does it create a needless obstacle and hostility? Not a difficult issue. We've been wedded to demeanor evidence for a very, very long time. It was a real titan to set up against the equality interests of these women participating in the justice system. But Ultimately, there needs to be vigorous analysis, vigorous assessments of the bona fides of the conditions and assumptions of our justice system to see ultimately whether we can have a fair trial for the accused, the witness, and for society as a whole. And in my remaining 30 seconds, I want to say that one of the unfortunate truisms of law is that there is an inverse relationship between how interesting a case is and how much it pays. So I've been doing corporate commercial for the last four or five years to pay the bills so that I can do cases like this because this is what gets you up in the morning. Thank you. Is that better? All right. Can you hear me in the back? So uh, just to talk about what's at stake in this case for my client, who's uh, charged with very serious charges. Uh, if convicted, he's likely to go to jail for a very long time looking at possibly a double-digit prison sentence. And uh, this uh, entire case really rests on the word of a single witness. And uh, he's somebody who's presumed innocent uh, and uh, likely to see this witness get up and testify in what's an apparently plausible way that he committed these offenses. And really, his whole life is riding on the ability of his counsel to uh, cross-examine that witness effectively. Now, uh, in terms of how a lawyer prepares for cross-examination, Usually, it's a very instinctive sort of process. It's one of the hardest uh, parts of being a trial lawyer. It involves a lot of interaction with the witness, trying to read the witness. Uh, and uh, I'm sure we're all familiar with uh, how much easier it is to understand somebody in person, say, than over the phone, or over the phone 
than in writing, and it's uh, it, because of feedback, including that of facial expressions. So for uh, an accused who's looking at a lengthy prison sentence to have uh, his lawyer handicapped by the inability to really read the witness, to perfectly understand what the witness is trying to communicate in order to uh, prepare for what's this really critical cross-examination, uh, is a, a serious handicap. And uh, even though obviously the criminal justice system uh, has a lot of value to our society, primarily and including for, uh, for victims and, and the public, primarily what's at stake in this entire process is the liberty of the accused. And uh, it's his rights that uh, ultimately uh, argued in the court should take primacy. But uh, that said, I, I think this issue, it's important to look at the context uh, uh, of each particular case. And in that sense, I agree with what the Court of Appeal decided. It's got to be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis. And uh, I wouldn't uh, argue that a blanket rule against wearing kneecaps is appropriate. Uh, really, uh, having a sexual assault case is about as difficult a case as we can imagine for this to uh, arise for the first time. In other countries, it's come up where defense witnesses have wanted to testify with a veil. Uh, you could imagine a case where the accused wanted to testify with a veil uh, would raise really different issues. So where, where it's a sexual assault, obviously we've got, uh, in some ways, a, a history of uh, the mistreatment of sexual assault complainants, including at preliminary inquiries, that sort of looms over what happened in this case. And that's something, something to consider, as the Court of Appeal did. Uh, where it's a defense witness... The ability of the accused to, uh, to defend him or herself obviously weighs in on the other side. So I'd say where the defense seeks to call a witness who's unwilling to testify without uh, wearing any cab, that's, uh, that's something that should be respected. It, we could imagine, for example, there was a case uh, just in the past week in France where uh, a woman in a kneecap was assaulted by somebody offended by her wearing a kneecap, and uh, she t tore the kneecap off and injured the woman. Uh, if that woman was coming to court to... Uh, to testify about what happened to her, and the, uh, the justice system told her she had to take the kneecap off, much like her attacker did before she was allowed to tell her story. It, it probably wouldn't be a proud day for the justice system. So uh, I agree with uh, what the Court of Appeals said, that we've got to look at that context, the position of Muslims in our society. My client, obviously, is Muslim as well, uh, in deciding this issue on, uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. In this case of sexual assault complaints, is really a particularly difficult one. So I think that's... Uh, I have to say for now. Thanks. My name is Tyler Hansen. Can everyone hear me okay? Uh, I represented an organization called the Muslim Canadian Congress, and um, most people that are not familiar with the organi organization presume um, that they would have basically backed the right of the complainant to wear the niqab at the preliminary hearing. That, in fact, is, is not the case. And uh, initially, uh, everyone consented to us becoming interveners in the case. Then my client, who's a bit of a nightmare client and can't keep quiet in front of the media, issued some statement saying that he wanted to ban the burqa through all of Canada, and quickly we were the subject of a motion to delist which fortunately we survived and we were able to make our arguments before the court. By way of my personal background, I have been uh, both a Crown and a defense counsel. I am a defense counsel currently. I have uh, prosecuted sexual assault cases and I have defended people accused of sexual assault. I, um, I did a three-year, I lived for three years in the United Arab Emirates and I practiced law there as well. I, I know, it's just of interest. Um, that in that civil law system, if the complainant had come forward in a criminal trial in the United Arab Emirates, she would not be allowed to wear her niqab while testifying. Here, obviously, that, that isn't settled law, so we have the court uh, weighing in on it for the first time. Um, I, I can indicate, uh, for those that aren't familiar, because I, I wasn't at the time, there's, there's a very big difference between the types of clothing that are worn by, by Muslim women. There's the niqab which does not obscure the face but covers the hair. Sorry, that's the hijab, thank you. <laughs> the niqab, which is what was at issue in this case, which is the slit, basically. It's the eye slit. And then there's the burqa, which is the image you commonly see uh, with Afghanistan, where there's actually a fine mesh over even the eyes so that there's nothing visible of the facial features. I actually wrote an article against the French law banning conspicuous religious symbols in public schools in 2004 because it did not allow women to wear the hijab 
in these settings. And I was terrified that that article was going to be used against me in this case, but yeah, fortunately, <laughs> fortunately, it wasn't. Um, and I happen to believe that there's a, a very fundamental difference between banning something like this in a, in a public place, like a school, and in the context of a criminal defense trial. As Michael has indicated, there are very serious consequences and repercussions for someone that is accused of a serious crime. This is, as, as the Court of Appeals said itself, it, it's hard to imagine a worse stigma being attached to you. Not only is it a sexual offense, but it's, it's, a, it's pedophiles, it's childhood sexual offense. And the court rightly observed, I think, not only are they members of the Muslim community, they go to the same mosque. Certainly, the fact that there was an arrest in, in, at all has, has changed their lives forever. But now they are, in a very real sense, fighting for their lives if they're going to be incarcerated or if they'll remain free. And that's the context in which the court had to grapple with this very difficult issue. Now, I've indicated that my client has what some people have termed a progressive position, other people have termed an extreme position, and that is that the niqab has no place in, in, in Canada. That is not at all what I argued in the court, and that's not what I'm certainly here to talk about today. I, I want to confine my remarks to, to the actual case that was before the court. Um, our client took the position that you could not presume that because a woman wore a niqab, she did so for religious reasons. What does that mean? There are other reasons that, in my client's view, a woman could wear a niqab. There are cultural reasons. There are political reasons. Uh, and my client simply asked that there be an inquiry, some kind of inquiry made of the witness in the context of her testifying to ask her, why is it important for you to wear the niqab? Initially, in their written submissions, the complainant and Leaf took the position that such an inquiry is entirely inappropriate. The court said there has to be an inquiry, uh, and it's debatable as to how, how, how broad the scope of that inquiry will be. The court has certainly limited it to saying it should only go to the sincerity of her, her particular religious beliefs. So I think Leaf would argue if, if the woman said, look, it's important to me as a principle of my faith as a Muslim to wear a niqab, that would be the end of the inquiry. I don't know if it's going to play out that way. The court has left the door open for the fact that the defense should be entitled to cross-examine on this inquiry, that the defense should be entitled to call evidence on this inquiry, that they should look into the issue of the sincerity of the woman's religious beliefs. Now, some interveners have said, we don't care if it's religion or not. I mean, we don't care how you, you categorize it. It could be equality rights. It could be freedom of expression. The woman should be entitled to wear the niqab. That wasn't obviously the issue before the court, and in this decision, I think the court said, look, we're clearly limiting our remarks to freedom of religion. If this arises in another context, we'll deal with it then. So we had said what's important in the inquiry is to look at whether or not there's any exceptions the witness has to wearing the niqab in public. And the case that we use as an example that we thought was our strongest case was Maltani. Maltani is a case where a Sikh wanted to take his kirpan, the ceremonial dagger, to a school in Montreal, and the school board had said, I'm sorry, we consider this to be a weapon, and it's not, it's not permitted. He appealed it all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said he has the right to wear it. One of the key factors that the Supreme Court saw in, in making that decision is that Maltani had filed an affidavit saying, that he always wore the kirpan and admitted to absolutely no exceptions. He wore it to bed. He wore it when he took a shower. He never, ever took it off. And the, in the, in the majority decision of the Supreme Court actually cites that in their judgment and says, for this reason, we think that it's a very sincere belief and obviously it doesn't admit of any exception. So, so there's no way that you can deprive him of this right that's, that's going to be insubstantial. If you make him take it off, it's going to be a substantial intrusion on his rights. One of the interesting issues at play here was that the, that the woman in question, for those aren't familiar with the facts, had permitted herself to be photographed in her license without wearing the niqab. I don't know if she had the hijab or not, but her face was... was she, did. she did. Her face was visible. So 
this was an issue that obviously came to the court, and it was an issue that the preliminary inquiry judge put a lot of emphasis on. The preliminary inquiry judge said, well, look, you know, it does admit to exceptions. Sometimes it seems you're, you're willing to appear in public without the niqab. And if that's the case, you know, in such an important context such as a criminal trial, I think you should be willing to do the same. I think the Court of Appeal said that they might have, the, the preliminary inquiry judge might have overemphasized this fact. But for us, it was important to emphasize that there were exceptions at play here, unlike in Multani. Um, I mean, Leaf has said that, that it's no accident that this arose first in a sexual assault case. But that's only in Canada. In every other, in every other case around the world where this issue has arisen, it has not been a sexual assault case. In the Razumju case in, in New Zealand, it was a fraud. I believe it was the same in the Australian case, although I stand to be corrected. It certainly wasn't a sexual assault case. In the American cases that have considered this issue, they were actually about the driver's license. So in Florida, a woman actually petitioned the, the Ministry of Transportation to say, I don't want to take my driver's license picture with my niqab removed. And ultimately, the court said, sorry, it's, it, in this society, you have to. If you want to drive, it's a privilege. You have to remove it. In the Michigan case, it, I can't remember, but it certainly wasn't a sexual assault. Small claims court. Small claims court. So in our submission, you, you have to approach it on a case-by-case -case basis, but it's, it's not going to always involve a sexual assault. The issues are far more difficult when it's a sexual assault case, but it will arise in other cases as well. And I think the effect of the court's decision here, when they say you have to approach each and every case individually, is to look at the role of the witness in the niqab. So the court has said, if they're basically a peripheral witness and their credibility is not going to be at issue. So, for example, if they're called to introduce business records, in almost no case will the defense be able to satisfy the burden of saying, she must remove the niqab for my right to full answer and defense to be enjoyed. On the other hand, where the witness is central to the prosecution's case, where, where the prosecution turns on her evidence, the court has said it's far more likely the defense will be able to satisfy that burden. And whether you agree with it or not, our reading of the case is, the court says, by way of conclusion, if these two rights conflict and they cannot be reconciled, the right to full answer and defense must trump and the woman must remove her niqab. Thank you very much. Hi, so as, uh, as uh, was mentioned, my name is Zara and I'm the legal director of the Metropolitan Action Committee on Violence Against Women and Children. Um, I, I feel like responding to everything that was said, but I'm going to hold back until maybe we're, it's time for asking questions uh, and, and stick to what I want to focus on. And what I want to talk to you today about is the public interest in this, in this case. And um, before I do that, I'm going to tell you two quick stories. So in my years of practice, I've uh, been an immigration and refugee lawyer. I've worked at legal clinics, always working with women who experience violence. And uh, I've done a, a bunch of different things. And one of the things I did was I worked in uh, restorative justice. And I would get youth who uh, usually were either racialized or aboriginal out of the criminal justice system, and we would do uh, uh, programming, we would do restorative justice sentencing circles where youth would come and we'd talk about how to heal, how to repair, how to take responsibility. At that time, I remember asking a, a youth defense lawyer who was a friend of mine, you know, maybe I should just get into youth defense instead of because there's so many criminal justice issues, and he said to me, Zara, are you kidding <laughs> he said to me, you know, you have an interest in meaningful change. You have an interest in um, asking people to take responsibility and really grow and learn. As a defense lawyer, your job is to get your client off. Second story that um, that uh, that I was reminded of when I was coming today was I remember hearing a very famous Toronto-based criminal lawyer, and he was speaking to first-year lawyers, and he gets in there and he says, there's two strategies. When you go into a hearing, you've got to decide 
which witnesses you want to maim and which witnesses you want to kill. And it was all about you maim the witnesses that, you know, won't hurt your case too much, and you kill the witnesses who could damage your case. Okay? And this is the context of our criminal justice system. This is the adversarial nature of our criminal justice system. And this is the context for sexual assault hearings since they've been heard. And the experience of women who've gone into, who've had the courage to, one, step up and say, I've been sexually assaulted, in a culture and society that still denies sexual assault, that I've been sexually assaulted, they go into a criminal justice process and they get maimed or they get killed. Every single woman that I've talked to who's been through a hearing based on sexual assault comes out and tells me, I wish I hadn't done that. I feel more traumatized now than I did before I went in. I feel like I was raped over and over and over again. So in the realm of sexual assault, where for decades women's advocates, advocates fought for a ban on producing evidence that was irrelevant, like you can't go on for 45 minutes about the fact that she was wearing fishnet stockings. You can't go on about the fact that, yeah, she likes to have sex. And then we got rape shield laws which said only adduce relevant evidence. And then we heard the Yuan Chuck case, which said there's no such thing as implied consent. No means no, and only yes means yes. Right? That's what we heard. 20 years later, we've been doing court watches every two years. Just this past year, 15 law students observed sexual assault trials at the seven courts in the GTA. And what did we see? What did we see at these sexual assault hearings? We heard Crown counsel who didn't object to irrelevant evidence. We heard defense lawyers who hammered, who hammered victims who came forward, just hammered them. That's what we heard and saw. We saw judges that were checked out sometimes and were falling asleep. And then we look at the statistics. 25 years ago, less than 10% of women reported sexual assault. 2007, a report came out, less than 6% of women report sexual assault. They say that every it, of all women in Canada, 50% by the time they're 21 will have experienced a sexual assault. And if you're an Aboriginal woman, 75%. And if you're a disabled woman, 88%. Okay? So we've got a problem here. We've got a very serious problem. There is a lot of sexual assault happening in this country. Only 6% of them are being reported to the police. Less of them go actually even to a hearing. And then the le most recent statistic that I've heard is of the ones that go to a hearing, we only see convictions in 10% of those. 10%. So I would suggest that it is our public interest to make sure that it is a priority that sexual assault victims have access to justice, and when they do access the, ju the justice system, they don't get further victimized. I would say that it's a public interest to make sure that Muslim women I can't even imagine this woman, NS, who was raped as a child. Okay, 
I'm a survivor of sexual abuse. I know what it's like to talk to my family about that experience with, with, with a family member. Nobody believes you. No one. No one. Rob Ford, who might get elected as our mayor, was charged with assaulting his wife. That's the kind of person we're going to... And, and you talk to people, how can you vote for Rob Mayor? Oh, well, that's not such a big deal. It's not such a big deal. I was talking to police officers who were investigating a, a, a gang rape of a 14-year-old girl who went to a bush party. Well, what was she doing as a 14-year-old girl going to a bush party anyway? Right? This is where we're at in society still. It's still the woman's fault for experiencing sexual assault. It's still not believed when she comes forward. And it's still really hard to get a conviction. So I would say to you that I can't think of a greater public interest issue right now is that women who experience violence, especially women who experience sexual assault, have full access to the justice system, especially regardless of what they're wearing. I want to ask you a question to think about. After this case, which Muslim woman is going to come forward and report? She's going to think, first of all, the police are going to give me a hard time, and then I might not even get to a hearing until, what is it, two years later? And excuse me if I don't cry a river for the uncle who raped his niece. Poor guy. Oh, yeah, his life's going to be impacted. If you're a sexual assault survivor, the rest of your life is impacted. I believe clearly in innocent before proven guilty, but let's at least get to the hearing. Enough with the distractions, enough with the bells and whistles, enough with the tactics to try and stop women from going through hearings and let her speak and let her be heard. Well, you folks did a fabulous job. <laughs> just, no, I mean, really, I would think that you packed an awful lot of uh, pretty accessible stuff in just a few minutes. Thank you oh, all good. so much. Good. It was uh, really useful, I think. So the floor is um, open to uh, questions and comments. I see, uh, this, this is how I noticed them, one, two, and three. Okay? So... And you just want to hear comments from whom, whomever wants to offer them. Sure. So feel free. 
I was just going to say the decision's a little bit biblical in that it kind of stands for everything. Uh, and you know what? Because they had a lot to grapple with. It was much more complicated, I think, than they had sort of anticipated at first blush. And so what they said was, wow, whew, that's important. Wow. That's really important, too. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Good thing we don't have to decide it. We're going to let the trial judge decide it. But I think to a certain extent they had to do that, right? Because... You know, it is somewhat nuanced. Tyler's right that Leaf was very concerned about the sincerity hearing because I find it offensive to have to have a sincerity hearing. Somebody shows up in their cap, like, come on. Is she, if they showed up in their kippa or a nun in her habit, would we be saying, oh, how serious are you about that habit business? You know, we just, no, like, let's just get past the sincerity and then talk about the demeanor. Like, is demeanor truly important in this? And I think you're right. They came down all. I think that was a loss from our side, at least, because I think they reinforced that demeanor continues to be important. Um, they recognize all the literature saying that it's misused. It's misused with accused people all the time. And ironically, the studies show that police officers are better than judges and lawyers at assessing credibility. So if the police are better at that, and Guy yeah. Paul Moran's eyes are kind of going like this when they're talking to him, and therefore he's guilty... I mean, that's, it's scary, right? So, but on the whole, they came down on the side of 800 years of common law, I think. Well, and probably nobody but the Supreme Court could suddenly say, we've decided demeanor's not important, given that it's really a fundamental uh, feature of our justice system and how it's entirely arranged. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't take the, what those studies have found too far. They have found that some people are better than chance at using facial expressions to determine credibility, but also... Assessing credibility isn't the only thing that's uh, important. Uh, when you're cross-examining somebody, you're really not trying to detect when they're lying or not entirely. It's, uh, it's, just, it's about reading uh, emotions. It's about understanding what they're saying and the nuances of what they're saying, which you can use facial expression to, uh, to do. Or one example I used during the hearing, uh, at, at a murder trial recently, the, uh, the Manners case where it's a murder in a school, well, one witness, uh, it was an important point whether a witness had uh, skipped class a certain time. So she's asked that in cross-examination and said no, but gave a little smile. The cross-examiner said, I see that you smiled there. You really did skip class, didn't you? And she retreated and said, I don't remember. And that was an important point, and that's a point that you lose. So it's not just about being able to magically detect whether somebody's lying or not from facial expressions. It's about just using uh, all of uh, human communication, which we really uh, intuitively do. And so... Uh, I think we can't be very quick. And really, the onus, uh, if people want to throw a demeanor and say that uh, go to paper hearings, uh, the onus has to be uh, on people who want to do that, I think, to show better evidence than we have so far from the social science that's been done. I, j I just want to say that uh, the idea of uh, defense lawyers um, interpreting even my behaviors is really frightening. Um, I'm dating a white man right now, and uh, and I feel like we are on two different panels sometimes when we're talking, and he's a therapist, right? Like, he's trained in people's behavior. Um, and, and sometimes we talk, and we're like, like this. So... Why would we why would we validate such subjective interpretation as as something by which to uh, make assessments? She's she's talking. Listen. I, I mean, just very quickly to add, I, I think I think Sue's right. I think the court ultimately says demeanor is important, um, and 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 trial judges can take judicial notice of that fact. And something is lost when you can't observe facial assessments, whether or not that leads to an infringement of full answer and defense another, is another question, but something is lost. One of the interesting things, and one of the points that, that we lost on is, uh, we had submitted to the panel, you know, when you're wearing in a cab, it, it, it's, not that you, it's not like you just lose the facial expression. Um, and, and there was a great description that the New Zealand trial judge gave of what it's like to listen to a witness testifying in a the cab. They're very loose garments. So, the only thing that you're basically left with are the voice and the eyes. And that trial judge, uh, the analogy he used was the, the evil computer howl in 2001 in Space Odyssey. That's what it was like to, to, li to listen to a witness in those circumstances. I think, I think ultimately the court said, and they didn't, they didn't buy that at all. They said, look, there's still some demeanor evidence that's available for a witness in the cab. But ultimately, we have to say that there is something lost. 
Um, I've got a question here, so it's you first, and then I don't know your name, unfortunately. You, um, got Emily here, and then got the question. Uh, fellow at the back, thanks. Go ahead. So my question is it's maybe more of a comment, and I'd like to hear what you think about it. Um, but I just wonder about the importance of demeanor evidence again, and what implication it has for the equality rights of lawyers and judges with visual disabilities. Um, are we saying that an accused can't have a fair trial if the judge or a juror or his defense counsel has a visual disability because they can't read the demeanor? That was certainly discussed at the hearing. That was one of the illustrations. I mean, David Lepofsky, a very effective cross-examiner, um, and um, yet visually impaired. And uh, that's, that's a very good example. And there are certainly blind judges in England. There's a number of uh, blind judges in England. So what they can't perform their function. Um, but what makes me suspicious on the equality basis is uh, if a witness came and they'd been horribly scarred in a, in a fire, for example, would we seriously say, sorry, but, you know, you don't have much demeanor going on in that face of yours. Uh, you, you can't testify about the arson, right? I mean, they just, I just doubt we'd say that. Um, so I think the court was very alive to the nuances of this, and, and they didn't want to. They absolutely had in mind the possibility of counsel who couldn't see and didn't want to obviously exclude that and, and that from the justice system. So actually, for the Court of Appeal, I've been doing this long enough to know that this was pretty good on equality. They actually said the E word. <laughs> <laughs> they, said, they said in a footnote, section 50, that we don't have to consider that, that, that. But then in paragraph 80, they do use the E word. Okay, please. Um, this is just more of a general question. I was just wondering if in any of your arguments, or I don't know if this is really in the scope of the case itself, but was the issue of accommodation discussed at all? Because for uh, women who work in the cop, they're able to, you know, take off the, their veil in front of a woman. So was there anything maybe discussed sort of as an alternative, or, you know, was that the case at all? I, I hate to dominate, but I was so thrilled about this. This was actually incredible. And there was a lot of talk, and we didn't, and LEAF, we didn't really believe in accommodation. First of all, we don't like the notion of accommodation. I think the disability rights community has kind of regretted to some extent walking down that particular road. You're not accommodating us. Thanks very much. We have every right to be here and to be included. Okay, so that's the first thing. And the second thing was it's a difficult thing to accommodate. It's because, you know, it's not like you can testify behind a screen or this or that. It's, you know, it's difficult. That being said, the one thing we, we were talking about, oh, there should be all female staff and judges and lawyers right on. And we're sitting this back in the leaf offices. It shows up in the judgment. <laughs> I couldn't believe that. Justice Jordan said, well, perhaps there has to be a female judge and all the defense. <laughs> <laughs> couldn't believe it. Yeah, I think I think that was that was certainly uh, exceptional. I don't think any party dared even ask for it. Not not no. at the oral hearing anyway. No. But I mean, I think there was there's certainly the the crown. I mean, it's very interesting. The crown in this case was really a neutral party, um, and they they what was the term they used? Comfort. comfort? Uh, it was basically reasonable accommodation. They didn't use that right, term, right. but the idea was is that you know you would gauge it to every witness. So some witnesses might be okay with. Uh, uh, clearing everybody out of the courtroom except for the accused. Some will still want all female staff and see where it goes. And I think the spirit of the court's decision is, you know, if, if we try, we can all reach some kind of compromise that's going to work. And that may be part of the inquiry, not just a sincerity inquiry, but to, you know, get to the scope of uh, the witness's belief and when she feels able to take it off. Could, could we use a closed-circuit television in another room and have her... Uh, take off an e-cab in that room where there's nobody there. You know, that's something to be looked into, I think, with each individual witness in, in each case. Um, I wanted to <clears throat> follow up a little bit on, on what Zara had said. Um, or, anyway. So two relevant points in my personal background. I have worked as a exceptional counselor, and um, I have also recently worked in South Africa, so I was interacting, interacting cross-culturally um, and had to become very attuned to some of the different ways that people use body language and different cultures, things that we, one of the big things for me, for example, was learning that eye contact there is a huge no-no. So I can see a case, for example, where a, 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 a witness
witness would be refusing to make eye contact with counsel, that would be read as your demeanor is not, you know, reliable. But in fact, that would be in the context of that person's culture, an extremely reliable thing for them to be doing. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess my question comes sort of, sort of, Michael, to mm -hmm. you, but do you feel that you're fully competent in reading cross-cultural communication cues from somebody who A, is a woman, B, is, is recently undergone something seriously traumatic, I don't know what this woman's cultural background, specific cultural background is. I mean, it might be very different than than even mainst than even Muslim Canadians who've been here for a long time. So I mean, I'm just I don't mean to kind of you know be hard on you, but <laughs> I mean, this is a this is a really tough area of communication, and I mean, it concerns me as, as someone entering the you know the justice system. How does the justice system accommodate these? They're not accommodate. I don't mean to you know, like that, but deal with these questions about and that's something that affects the defense too. I had a client who was Sudanese who was accused of sexual assault and disbelieved by the trial judge because he wouldn't make eye contact with his accuser or with the judge and the court of appeals said the trial judge was wrong and uh, that was culturally insensitive. So that is uh, something that's been recognized by the system and can cut both ways. Mm -hmm. And it, I guess all I would say is uh, the fact that there's challenges and the fact that we have to recognize our limitations and be especially careful where it's cross-cultural doesn't necessarily mean that we should throw out uh, looking at demeanor altogether or get rid of what we uh, public trials that we have uh, with actual confrontation, allowing what uh, sort of assessment we can make. Uh, rather than just throwing up our hands and giving up, it's more a matter of recognizing our limitations and trying to work within them. <laughs> it's true of First Nations witnesses, right? Mm -hmm. So oftentimes, right, it's disrespectful to be staring you in the eyes and yet, oh, I can't, you're not looking me in the whites of the eyes. Question at the back, uh, and then, yes. Yeah, I, I, I'd be realized, I can only really comment on, on, on my personal experience. So I, I worked for, I was there for three years. The first two years I worked in basically a common law enclave, a bit like the Hong Kong model. Then the third year I worked in the uh, Arab civil system. And it's, the first time you walk into it, it's, it's extraordinary as it, a Canadian lawyer because you have the judge, often in a trial it's three judges, a panel, which you never get here. But then the best part is is that to, to the right of the judges the, is the prosecutor who actually sits up on the dais. <laughs> and then there's the defense lawyer and his client you know, underneath. So it's a very intimidating kind of environment for a defense lawyer in particular. Um, but one of the things that you know, was explored, and I, and I gather this is, is the reason for it, I, you know, I, I know that some countries like uh, Egypt and Syria, the, the niqab has been banned in all public places. Um, there, there was an opinion given by an imam, and the court refused to go here, and rightly so. They did not want to get into doctrinal debates. But in the Michigan case, which said there are a number of exceptions, there are a number of times you know, in, is, in, in, Islamic, in the Islamic religion where a woman is to remove the niqab and one of them is testifying in court. I hope that's helpful. Okay, and the, uh, yes, second question is to uh, Ms. Danani. Uh, I mean, I understand the uh, reliability of the statistics that 10% of the women are committed. I mean, not 10% of the accused are convicted. No. Only 10% report. That was so 10% reported 25 years ago, 6% report in well as of studies in 2007. I don't have the exact numbers, but very, very, very minuscule percentage. Since 
the other 90 or 94 percent are not important, what is the reliability of the statistics? But the statistics only speak to those that are reported. So what, what's the reliability, like reliability of what? The numbers, you say 10% are reported, that means the 90% are not reported. But if they are not reported, how do you judge them? And if they are not reported, how do you judge them? Well, there's all kinds of studies that are done informally with women, and they're asked, have you ever experienced sexual assault? And then you, based on those answers, you adduce how many sexual assaults are happening in the country, and, and that's where you get the percentages from. It's, it's like general surveys, and in fact, um, stats can did studies like that. Yeah. Was, did you want to add to that? Oh, okay. Question over here. That's a big one. I've, <laughs> I, we, we, I've, <laughs> I've had a lot of conversations like this too, and really, the just the inherent structure of our process um, would not allow for that, because everything turns on credibility, credibility of the accused and credibility of the witnesses, and so what do you, how do you, how do you disprove credibility? I think what you're doing here is a very important first step. I mean, I think education goes some way. It's not at all a perfect solution, but I think it's, at least in, in, in my experience in the Toronto criminal justice system, it's a very, it's a notorious fact now that, for example, uh, Aboriginal accused or witnesses do not tend to make eye contact, and there shouldn't be any adverse judgment due to that fact. So I think at least education, talking about it helps an awful lot. And as budding defense lawyers and crowns, um, you know, respect for the victim goes a long way. You know, we, as, it's a public interest for us to have society believe in the justice system. It's, it's, a, it's, it's an important uh, principle for us to, inc as people who are part of the justice system, to encourage people to trust the justice system. But if you always hear from people, we don't trust the police, we don't trust lawyers, and we don't trust the courts, based on their lived experience, um, you know, we've got a problem. So as defense lawyers and as Crown lawyers, um, the way you treat witnesses is really important. You don't have to kill or maim anyone. The question you raise is so enormous. When you look at the death row uh, um, acquittals, when you, you see the people, and that's the, presumably you would have thought that'd be the Cadillac judgment. Like they had the murder, they're going to get the best lawyers, and uh, get, it's going to be fully funded. And when you look at that as a barometer of how we're getting it wrong, mm -hmm. it's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and that's only with a certain, and that's only because we have forensic, often DNA or something like that, that's very conclusive, so that we can demonstrate the wrongness. Our forensic process has failed us horribly, and it's a very complicated equation as to why, um, but one of the identified factors is misuse of demeanor evidence. Please. reference to the idea that charter rights shouldn't just be weapons in a lawyer's arsenal, but that both parties should engage in some good faith efforts to try and think about what needs to take place in the courtroom in order to accommodate everyone's, not accommodate, I'm trying to that word, but actually I think probably in this context it is the right word to use, to accommodate everyone's needs in that situation. Um, of course, in the criminal context, unlike something like commercial arbitration, 
it's not like a whole lot of the procedures are up to parties to design or to negotiate. And so I was just wondering, um, for those that are involved in the case, to what extent do you see any room now that it's going back to the lower level for there to be any sort of discussion about what sort of content um, a, a new procedure might need to have in order to, to take into account this desire for witness to not take off the club, and yet, on the other side, the, the need to be able to have an effective cross examination. Um, and to what extent is that discussion happening between the parties, or are we still at that totally adversarial stage of, we want you to take off your niqab if you want to testify, I don't want to take off my niqab, you know, don't make it. And um, the second totally unrelated question that I had, had to do with um, you return in the judgment at several points to discussing juries and the importance of juries as the triers of fact to sort of evaluate the importance of demeanor evidence. And I was a little surprised by how many times the judges came back to that. And I was just wondering if you had any comments on kind of the, like, the perils of juries versus judges um, in assessing the evidence. I can say that I was a bit surprised by the, their emphasis on, on the jury system as well. As a matter of fact, it was the one part of the judgment that's a bit hard to follow because uh, at some point, one point they go so far as to say that if, if um, the jury is denied access to demeanor evidence, you're actually infringing the accused rights under Section 11F to a jury trial, which is something that was far beyond what anyone argued at the hearing. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not clear. I mean, certainly it's clear when they're saying judge alone, they're saying we, we trust a judge and he or she can decide, um, you know, if, if it's sufficient for, for uh, trial purposes to, for her to wear in a cab or not wear in a cab. And the judge has the right to revisit that decision so they can be wrong. They can say, oh, we didn't think it was that important and now it's important. It seemed to me that what they're suggesting with the jury is, is that it, the judge should never try and usurp that function. So that, that I, I would guess if you took it to a logical conclusion, it's hard. Does she yeah, then? Yeah, I didn't understand that. Mm -hmm. Does she then remove it automatically, or does she keep it automatically? Mm -hmm. It's it's that, for example, is one area where I think this issue will come back before the court. Yeah, I didn't understand that either. Yeah. How's the jury going to decide, and how are they going to express their decision? Oh, excuse mm -hmm. me, we'd like to have a remove. Or, like, <laughs> yeah. They're not. They're supposed to be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> I guess the, the justice system historically puts a lot of faith in sort of the common sense of, of juries, and whether that's wise or not, uh, I don't know. I mean, some lawyers uh, really lose faith in the jury system, uh, or some put a lot of stock in it. But we, we do traditionally warn juries to be careful of over-reliance on demeanor. But uh, really, the, the theory is jurors are the triers of fact, and we can warn them all we like, but it's in, ultimately up to them. And that's pretty strongly ingrained in the justice system, and that's, I guess, why... Uh, why that was such a big factor in the court's decision. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm not sure any of us are involved in, uh, for your first question, in the ongoing negotiations that may or may not happen at trial or what will happen in this case. For, for future cases, I mean, I expect this will be something that will be talked about at judicial pretrials. Judges will make a big effort to try to broker something that uh, makes everybody happy. Mm -hmm. I, I might also expect, in a, in a lot of jury trials, some defense lawyers may think that uh, uh, with you know the public uh, opinion being what it is about the kneecap, that it may be to their advantage to allow a witness to wear the kneecap, and that may be something that uh, a jury won't necessarily appreciate. Bingo! <laughs> <laughs> Which is why I only cared about the preliminary inquiry. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't ask a question, I'm going to. <laughs> it's all right. I may. Um, when I read the decision, and I'd read about it in the press, and I got, I, I think the press accounts that I was reading um, did exaggerate this business about imagining how these interests might be reconciled. For example, only women left in the room. So I think there was more emphasis put. So I sort of had my antennae up for that, and then it plays really quite a minor role in the decision. But um, I find, so I'm trying on a hypothetical. I'm trying on a hypothetical to, to illustrate why I find that worrisome that that might be entertained as a, a plausible solution. And it is, well, here's my, here's my hypothetical. Imagine that the person in question is not a Muslim woman, but is a white supremacist, and her, sincerely, you have to buy that it's sincere, 
her sincerely held belief, and it doesn't have to be religious, it can be a matter of conscience, although we can turn it into religion if we don't want to keep it in freedom of religion. Her sincerely held belief is that black people are bad, that she's supposed to be separate from them, she cannot testify in the presence, if you don't like black people, just fill in the blank, right? The point is, would we accede to that? And if not, why not? So I, all these things immediately come to my mind, separate but equal. What are we actually talking about here? That's decontextualizing. It's degenderizing. And, and that's why we don't go with religion alone. Mm -hmm. It's not just a religious right. It is an equality right. It's an access to justice right, as guaranteed by Section 7 of the Charter. And you can't decontextualize it in that way. Um, she's not entitled to uh, or, or hold a racist uh, view. It's not a religion. It's um, and, and also you've you've made the wit the uh, person wearing it. I, I don't know. It's outside of the sexual assault context. You have to look. Well, we can at put it in the sexual the assault context. We can do, we can absolutely replicate every single fact here. Remember, maybe her assailant was black, or her alleged assailant. Where, you know, this is all just allegations. And it doesn't have to be religion, it can be conscience, because Canadians have freedom of conscience and religion, and there should be no important distinction, should be no important distinction there. It's a sort of other facet of this is a kind of, in, sometimes when I read the judgment, I thought, they're infantilizing her. I could almost see them sort of patting her on the, on the head, saying, you know, we're going to indulge you in your inability to take this off. Um, we don't expect you to live up to the duties of citizenship. I mean, there are people who write on these sorts of things at a, at a sort of more general level and not even necessarily with a, a application only to Canada who take that view, who would say, Muslims themselves would say, hold us to the same standard. We don't want, we don't want to be seen as anything less. I'm, I'm just being provocative, yes, um, but I, it really worries me. Anyway. The same is not... Equal. Sure. Right? It's sure. not a matter of being held to the same set. You know, oh, it's the same standard for everybody. Same is not equal. Mm -hmm. It is an interesting point, though, and, and um, I talked about this in one of the other panels we had on this case because the Crown was, I thought, decidedly neutral here. I'll tell you where the Crown is not neutral in the prosecution of the Church of the Universe and Church of the Gerbil mm -hmm. for pot possession That's because. Right. You're right. That the difficulty, and, I, and I always we always danced around this, is if if you accept our Supreme Court's view that religion is entirely subjective in nature, then what happens? It's what the Crown has come to realize in the Church of the Gerbil case. If religion is everything, then religion is nothing. In the U.S., they have a very different test, and I don't think that the civil liberties organization in the United States would have taken the same position that it took in Canada. In the U.S., there has to be some attachment to established religious practice in order to have a sincere religious claim. So what Sue kept saying is, oh, for heaven's sakes, it's, it's an akab. Just recognize that it's religious. And the problem with that is, it leads down the path the court doesn't want to go. Why do we recognize it's religious? Because it's an established religious practice from a major orthodox religion, right? And then we get to say, all right, so let's consider the orthodoxy of the religion. Let's consider whether or not the religion actually requires someone to wear the niqab. No, 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 we don't want to do that. It's her subjective belief that matters. But if it's her subjective belief that matters, it's going to be different each and every time it comes before the court, which is where I think the court landed ultimately. Oh, I don't know if they did. <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think they want to get into some religious doctrinal thing. Oh, uh, have you had non-halal meat? Do you have sex out of marriage? Do you smoke? Do you drink? You know, I, I don't think they want to go there. I, who's perfect in their religion? Nobody. Um, you know, Chinese food can be kosher on New Year's, right? Um, so I, I, I just don't think we want to be holding and having a sincerity hearing on that level. I think it's a major religion. Somebody comes in a paper bag, uh, let's talk. But you come in in a cab. Yeah, we've heard of that. Yeah. That, to me, it should be baseline. And I, I agree with you that they, they talk both ways on it. But the Supreme Court of Canada in Anselm has said it's just a skimpy inquiry. Because we can't go there. We can't judge and evaluate religions and nexus to religion. This question, fourth row. Thank you. 
believing is true or whether she believes that it's true. Or I'm just a little confused as to how they would go about deciding the sincerity hearing. Mm -hmm. um, so if you could elaborate on that. I think they're still stumbling over that. And in and, and, and Anselm, they said, you know, oh, yeah, you say you're a member of a religion. We've heard of that religion. Um, and, yeah, it doesn't show up in the Quran, Niqab. But um, at the same time, Islam and Judaism are a little different than Christianity. I mean, Christianity, if it's not in the Bible, right, but it's more rabbinical. And so there can be rabbinical scripture. And even though it's not part of the Quran, it's, uh, you know, Fatima... Muhammad's wife, of course, wore a veil. That's good enough for me. Somebody comes forward and they say, I, I'm very troubled by our, as a society, getting into scrutinizing the sincerity. That's when we wouldn't do it with a nun's habit, because we heard of that too. And a keeper. So why in 2010 are we targeting an ACAP? But would you see the inquiries any different, for the example, that Janet gave with a white supremacist that shows up in a hood? She says, it's my religion. I started believing this yesterday. According to Anselm, good enough, and you come. No, I don't believe that. You don't believe that? I don't think that is um, a recognized religion, is it? It doesn't have to be a recognized religion. It's entirely subjective. I don't think it is entirely. I know what you're saying, that Anselm has suggested that it could be, you know, you're the church of one, Okay. Uh, but, but I mean, the Aryan nations, I mean, it's, it's not that there are not white supremacists. Mm -hmm. There are groups, they have their symbols, they have their mm -hmm. rituals, as evil as they are, right? I mean, that's. The I point. guess this is what we call the pornographic mm -hmm. exception. So when we were fighting to uphold the rape shield law, everybody came up with the, oh, what about that woman that's at the bar that's always consenting? Oh my God, I've got to strike down the law because there's that woman in the bar that's always consenting. Right? And so I view that as the pornographic exception, and I think this is similar. I'm not going to exclude a whole marginalized group of people in an obviously recognized religion on the, um, on the premise that somebody from some fringe hate organization is going to come forward and insist that uh, their racist views have to be upheld in a court of law. My example's a nasty one, but the, the point is it was it, the, the, the nastiness of, of exempting, banishing then all the black or whatever people out of the room, that was it. But, I mean, the point of using counterexamples isn't to vitiate everything else because you can come up with it. It is to say what are our actual principles at work here because there's principles. I mean, what, how I read the Court of Appeal decision was as articulating <laughs> principles that then will get applied in the individual cases, right? And that's where you contextualize and I was worried about this kind of going in that direction as a, as a general possible or feasible solution mm -hmm. because it didn't, <laughs> yeah. Um, and again, it did, it did ring these infantilizing sort of bells with me. Now, my daughter's sitting here in the front row, and she's already had a question. So <laughs> 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 who, can I see a show of hands as to, as to who wants to get in on this? Okay, how about, how about we, t we do this? We don't have much more time. We've got three questions. We've got, sorry, I don't know your name, of course, but in the fourth row, we've got you here again. And Emily, why don't you just briefly make your comments or state your questions, and then we'll give the panel sort of one last shot at, at reacting to those thoughts. Can we do it that way? I mean, all, all the major religions of the world discriminate against women. Every single one of them, you can find in their foundational texts material that discriminates against women. That's not a controversial statement. We can give you the citations, whether it's the Torah, the Quran, the Bible. It's just true. So our criterion cannot be that it's discriminatory. So it can't be that. And that's where the court didn't want to go with the kneecap. That's they didn't want to argue about whether that's a that's discriminatory right. belief. Some people would certainly say it's offensive to our charter values as well. But uh, we actually did, but they didn't listen. <laughs> <laughs> didn't get to me. <laughs> so it, you can't, I don't think that's a, a road that can be taken, a path actually out that can be taken. Yeah. I'd say the same. I mean, you should read the stuff that's in these 
these religious texts about women. There's a wonderful book called Does God Hate Women? I mean, read it. Don't think so, but Emily, did you want to get in again? I'm not sure if I do anymore, but, but because, because I appreciate what you're, I, appreciate, I don't like your counterexample. example. I know. I appreciate what you're doing with it. This has been around the dinner table so many times, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> but um, but I mean, to me, there's really something specific here, what Susan keeps saying, what, like, this, is, this is a sexual assault, it's, it's sexual assault is a specific kind of violence that is done against a person. I, I mean, I do hear what you're saying about, okay, we can have a white supremacist who's also raped and therefore be a you know. I, I don't know where I would go with that particular case, which is why I'm kind of relieved now having heard this conversation that the justice came down a little bit in case-by-case case basis. But uh, to me, there is something specific and important about allowing uh, this particular person to say that this is really important to me. There's been a preoccupation with women's clothing in sexual assault cases. Mm -hmm. You're wearing too little. You're wearing too much, <laughs> right? Um, Justice uh, Buzzy McClung from Alberta. <laughs> I'm from Alberta, too, so I didn't look at you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, originally from Alberta. <laughs> Let's try that. Uh, you know, oh, it's not like she showed up in a bonnet and crinolines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. actually, this woman yeah. did. Right? From, in the Muslim version of the bonnet and crinolines. And even that's not good enough. So there's, I, that's why I say you can't decontextualize. You've got to look at the gender, the race, the nature of the crime, all of it together to, to um, ascertain where the fair trial interests play. I don't see hands. Um, panelists, any final comments? I'm good. <laughs> no. I, I would just, the, the one... See, uh, they going, always do. Yes, exactly. <laughs> the one example, I mean, the hate crime, you know, the hate crime is very easy to dismiss, or the, or the white supremacist, and um, I think the more difficult example, and it gets outside of the, of the, I recognize this gets outside of the context of a criminal prosecution, but is um, something like polygamy, which is uh, actively practiced in Islam, uh, certainly was a part of, of society in, in the UAE when I was there, and is a crime in Canada under the criminal code, and is prosecuted in Canada. And I, I mean, I, I wonder, I, I like to kind of think about how different organizations like the Civil, Civil Liberties Union or LEAF would side on, on a case where, you know, a woman in a polygamous relationship came forward and, and was, was charged with a criminal offense. And would it make a difference if it was, you know, against her consent, well obviously it would make differences against her consent, that's not hardly, it's hardly a marriage, but I, I mean, is she unified with her husband, is she looking for an escape route? Um, I mean the one thing that, that you can't for, forget here is there really are, I, I sincerely believe, women on, on both sides of this equation. I think that there are some that very sincerely uh, wear the niqab for religious reasons and I think it would be a very difficult undertaking for them to testify in a court of law without it. I think on the other hand, and this is where you get more into kind of the French analysis, there are sincerely women who do not want to wear it and are told by their husbands when they leave the house, wear it. I want you to wear it. I'm your husband and you wear it. Anyway, that's my concluding remark. <laughs> yes, please. Exactly. That's right, because she's oppressed at home, perhaps abused sexually or physically or in any other ways. She can't come to the justice system and tell us about it because we're going to make her remove it. He's going to make her wear it. We're going to make her remove it. Just to say that there are organizations, and, and ours is one of them, that to, at least in our writing, we don't so much advocate, but in our writing we've said, been against, against the ban on the burqa or the niqab. I mean, mm -hmm. that is all about why are we so hung up about what women wear, please, you know. Um, but it's quite another matter when another individual human being has important rights at stake. Just obvious point, I guess. <laughs> yes, I think we still got a little bit of time. 
this morning we heard that the Court of Appeal from Ontario and Quebec got together and discussed things, right? Uh, that's very nice. How will the how will the Court of Appeal of Ontario relate to the Quebec law that bans? You know, I think if we can comment on that, I think it's just to our to inform the people. Strikes a blow at the law. It strikes a blow at the law in... in uh, do you want to explain what you mean by that? Do you, do you agree with the Quebec law? Or do you fight it or what? I don't think women um, should have to disrobe to see a doctor either. Facially. Or to receive um, medical attention, receive any of the other institutional services that are ordinary citizens are um, permitted to access. What about to board an airplane? A lot of women will remove the burqa for that purpose. In fact, I, I'm not familiar with a single situation where somebody hasn't been able to, uh, you know, because you can accommodate that in that situation where you have a female security officer who can do the inspection. Um, so it's, it's not... What about to vote? If there's identity is an issue, then a voting officer can, um, a female officer can ascertain whether this person is what they are. When was the last time any people looked at you carefully to find out when you were, right? Well, in Calgary, we have the possibility of mail-in ballots, so it would yep. be pretty uh, yeah, inconsistent to but have to show I, I your face to vote. I think that's an interesting point that might come up in some of these future uh, NECAB cases, because uh, the court said we have to look into exceptions that are made. And that, there was a big controversy about voting in NECABs a few years ago, and it sort yeah. of ended with the women who would want to vote saying that uh, this was an acceptable exception to the practice where it's uh, an important act of citizenship and where it's required by the rules, they're willing to make an exception that's not dishonorable. So uh, if if some of these exceptions are, are broadly practiced, that maybe the testifying is, is going to join them. And it maybe I think the court suggests that if you're making those sort of exceptions, testifying is going to have to be another one. All right. mm -hmm. Well, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe you'll all um, join me in thanking our panelists for doing a fabulous job. <laughs>